The Dalai Lama and Archbishop are writing a book together. And it's called The Book of Joy, Finding Enduring Happiness in an Uncertain World. These two, shall we say, well-seasoned men plan to meet several times to talk, and then someone else is going to write up their conversations and put them in a book for publication. And they've already had their first con uh, conversation, and I saw this very short video clip of it. And there's the 79-year-old Dalai Lama, red robes flowing, sitting up tall in his chair, leaning over toward the 83-year-old archbishop. Now, I don't think either of these men are tall, but compared to the small and round and very, very um, bald archbishop, the Dalai Lama looks big. And the Dalai Lama is talking about joy, and he reaches over to hold the archbishop's hand. And there are these two men holding hands, commenting about how the archbishop is always laughing. He's always smiling. He's such a joyful person. And the archbishop responds, oh, that must be because of his funny big nose. And they laugh, and this joy is just bubbling up between these two venerable sages. And it's not really about anything in particular, just the joy of being together and beginning this project that they're doing together. Where does this joy come from? How can these two men, both of whom who have seen so much suffering, so much tragedy and disaster injust and injustice in their own countries of Nepal and South Africa, as well as across the globe, be so compassionate, so knowledgeable, and so joyful. Earthquake in Nepal, unrest in Baltimore, school shootings, a friend dying of cancer, suicide, poverty, discrimination, apathy, violence, ignorance, spite, abuse, injustice. Some days it seems like it's just too much for our little hearts. I might add anxiety, broken relationships, sorrow, disillusionment, depression, distrust. It's been like this. It's the times we live in, it's the world we live in. So what is joy doing here and now in a time and place like this? Where do the Archbishop Tutu and the Dalai Lama find it? Well, surely Jesus' disciples were asking the same thing. Here we are in the Gospel of John, right in the middle of what's called Jesus' farewell discourse, Jesus' parting words to the disciples when he knows that his death is imminent. And here he starts talking about joy. He's already acknowledged that there are some troubled hearts, that those disciples are concerned, they're afraid about what's going to be coming. And in the coming chapters, there's a lot more about rejection and hatred and abandonment, and yet, at the same time, even more joy. Until now, Jesus says, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, so that your joy may be complete. And then he says later, but now I'm coming to you, and I speak these things in the world, so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. This idea of joy seems really misplaced in the midst of all the discussion of the cross to come. Joy seems inappropriate when you're being told that the one on whom you've relied will no longer be around. Joy is not the feeling you would think of first in the face of the realities that the Jesus and the disciples were facing, or that we often face, or that our world faces. <coughs> And yet Jesus insists on talking about joy. And maybe that's the point, that part of the gift of being human beings, beloved by God, is that we are given the capacity to experience joy even when things are a mess all around us and even when they are a mess for us personally. Doug and I went yesterday to the memorial service of our longtime friend, Sal Badalamenti, someone who you've been praying for for quite a while. And this is a man who's been, who was a little younger than I am, who was stricken by that scourge of cancer's pancreatic cancer. 
And he was, Sal was a kind and hardworking and extraordinarily generous person, and we will miss him. His wife, Jean, is one of my Pictionary ladies. She is, of course, <laughs> devastated, as are their three children who are now in their 20s, children who played with our boys when they were little. There is certainly nothing joyful about this situation. However, there are moments here and there, particular aspects, that are sources of great joy. For example, the three children got together and wrote and delivered at the service yesterday a beautiful tribute to their dad, dry-eyed with humor, reflecting their great respect and love for their father. And it was a moment of joy. Another is the relationship between Jean and her sister Julie. They've always been close, but Julie has been there for her sister in every way imaginable over the past few months as Sal got sicker. The sister relationship is a source of great joy for both of them. I'm sure the large number of people at the service yesterday, I would guess there were about 500 people there, brought joy to the family as they knew that Sal was loved and appreciated by so many people. These are all circumstances, moments, in which there was a choice made to rejoice, even in the midst of all that sorrow. And that, I think, is my point this morning, that sometimes we just have to choose joy, choose to notice the joy. The most recent issue of Presbyterians Today includes an article about the stories of three people who experienced different kinds of significant losses, and then responded to the loss, sometimes years later, with joyful service to others. One young woman grew up in Peru at a time when terrorist militias roamed around, striking fear into families as children were kidnapped and forced to become soldiers. Later, her father was paralyzed in a car accident and suffered from depression. But, she says, my parents always said that God does not abandon us and that we should never stop praying. She credits her growing up experiences as what strengthened her as a person, gave her perseverance, and as she says, a fighting character. Even in the midst of a life of hardship, injustice, and fear, she and her family experienced the joy of God's grace. This young woman and her husband are now administrators of a mission program in Peru that fights for human rights and environmental justice. Despite much suffering, this woman found a way to not only experience the joy of God's grace, but she responds today with joyful smiles of welcome and peace to those who need her help. One of the things she also does is um, a facilitator for a young adult volunteer program of the Presbyterian Church. So these young people arrive in Peru, not speaking the language, not knowing how to deal with this urban slum where the program is, and she welcomes them and helps them get acclimated and helps them find the joy of the situation where they're there to help. Maybe you remember Deborah, the young woman from Uganda and the Village to Village pro Project who visited us. She had endured terrible poverty, abuse as a child and as a teenager, but with encouragement and the help of the Village to Village program, she completed her education, she went to college, she got a law degree, and plans to work as a family lawyer and advocate in behalf of children and women. And if you remember her visit a couple of years ago, you remember her gratitude for the gift of hope and also her enormous and beautiful smile, the joy she knew and shared, reflecting her hope for her own and her people's future. Now, I don't mean this to sound Pollyanna-ish, Pollyanna -ish, that it's easy to just, you know, smile, 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 and suffering and problems go away, and joy showers down like rain. This is difficult. Joy is elusive. True joy is hard to come by, and real life seems all too often to waylay our best intentions. But intention, effort, determination are sometimes just what's, what's required. We have to decide 
that joy is the way we want to live, that the pursuit of joy is the way we want to be in the world. There's some definitions of joy. The emo one, the, uh, the emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune, or the prospect of possessing what one desires. Two, the expression or exhibition of such emotion. Three, a state of felicity. A source, four, a source or cause of delight. The question we all need to be asking ourselves is how do we arrange our lives so that we can experience joy in one or all of these ways? What do you need to remind yourself that joy can be part of your life? Who do you need around you to tell you that there is something to be joyful about? Now, we can't always choose how we feel. Feelings aren't always a matter of choice. We can, however, be conscious of, aware of the places, the circumstances, the people, the truths that remind us of the grace of God, that remind us of our blessings, that remind us of Christ's forgiveness, that remind us of the goodness of God's creation, the delight of life in God's care, the promise of life forever with God. The Greek words for joy and for grace, those two words in Greek, they share the same root. They come from the same word, which makes sense because an experience of joy is usually related to a sense of grace, an undeserved gift, a blessing that just comes, whether it's parents who love you and give you the courage and faith to endure fear and hardship, a sister who sticks by you even when the tough gets when the going gets tough, children who can stand up in front of 500 people and share their love for their father, the arrival of some caring, mission-minded people to your Ugandan farm community, the wonder of a beautiful day, the gift of family, good and worthwhile work to do, friends who care. All of these are gracious gifts that we can respond to with joy. Joy in the midst of all the things that can go wrong in a person's life, the life of a family, a church, a community. Joy in the midst of all, it, it, joy isn't the answer to all those problems. We can't just respond by, oh, I'm going to be happy about this. Rather, joy is an affirmation, a choice that we make in the midst of all of it in the midst of it all, to trust in God's grace when all that is good seems to be far away. It is the security of God's love when it seems like there isn't much love around. It is the hope that even in the darkest places of separation, God's love is indeed with us. Let us pray. Gracious God, sometimes it seems like joy is nowhere to be found. Teach us to look for joy not only in the immediate circumstances of whether or not things are going well for us. Teach us to look for joy in your grace, in the blessings of our lives, in the gift of your presence with us now and always. In the name of the one who fulfilled your promises, Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen.